So, today we're talking about representability. Ability. See, I can spell that, but I can't spell algebra. Um, all right, so, uh, recall from last time that some functor f some contravariant functor from c is a set uh, is represented by some x in c if f is naturally isomorphic to the functor of maps into x and similarly f a covariant functor set is represented by x if f is naturally isomorphic to the functor of maps going out of x. All right, and some people would call this second one co-represented, uh, but as Emily Real points out, that's kind of dumb because it should be clear what um, Direction you're talking about from the from the definition of the functor. Why wouldn't they call the first one co-represented? Uh, there was a reason, and I knew it last week, and now I can't remember. It it was. You had a question. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's a natural isomorphism. There's a natural transformation between them, and all of the components are isomorphisms. Okay. All right. So uh, now we're gonna talk about examples of these representable functors, and I have a lot of them. So, uh, the first one, obviously we start with the, with the simplest things we can come up with, so the identity on the category of sets, which goes from set to itself. Uh, is represented by a singleton set, which I might call, let's just say it's the set containing the letter A. All right. So what does that mean? We're saying that the functor of maps out of sets is naturally isomorphic to this identity functor. So if we have some set X, we're saying that the set of maps from singleton set into X is isomorphic to X as a set. So, uh, so we have um, the map that takes the map to say, sending A to some element X. So a map out of A is entirely determined just by what element it gets sent to and it sends that to x. And these are the components of the natural transformation from um, set A blank to the identity uh, for each x. All right. Oh, I wanted to do this in some detail, apparently. So let's see. We have, uh, for we'll, show, we'll show the naturality square for this. So we have maps out of the singleton set to x. And then we want to go to the identity functor on, on x, which is just x. And then we have the same thing for some set y. All right. So given some f here, we get a map um, from this set to this set which is um, f lower star because it's uh, covariant. Um, and then I have, OK, here I have the map that sends a to x. So I have some element in this set, and it's entirely determined by where it sends 
A. If I map across this, um, so these are the these are the components of the natural isomorphism. So if I map across here, I just get x by what I said here. If I map down here, it maps to the function. So it's the function from a to x, then to y, where this is f. And from above, we have that this, the, fir the first function was from a to x. And so that you know, then gets sent to f of x. And so across the bottom here, this gets sent to f of x. And then applying f here, this gets sent to f of x. And so this thing commutes. And so, we, so it is a natural transformation. <coughs> So I hope it's clear that this is an isomorphism um, in the category of sets. And so then we just have the naturality to show that it's a natural isomorphism. All right. Another example. So we have a forgetful functor. And u is usually used for forgetful functor from the category of groups. To set. Uh, all right, and this is the functor that takes a group and forgets the group structure and just remembers the underlying set. And it takes a group homomorphism and forgets that it's a group homomorphism and just is still a function between sets. All right, uh, so this functor is represented by the integers as a group. All right. Uh, <coughs> so we have, so representability means that maps from, uh, in this case means that maps from Z blank is naturally isomorphic to this forgetful functor. So in particular, for a given group, we have group maps from Z into the group are isomorphic to the group. And this is, oh, and this is um, witnessed by the map that takes 1 in Z, uh, and it takes it to G, and then we map that to G. So. Every map, every, every group homomorphism from the integers into a group is determined by where it sends 1. Um, and so we can sort of pick any group element in G. Um, and just remember, this is, as a, this is an isomorphism as, um, as a set, not, not as a group. So I'm not saying that. Um, this is isomorphic to G as a group. I'm saying that this as a set is isomorphic to G as a set. Um, I think it might be, uh, but I, 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 I want to talk about. I want to say things in general, generality. Um, all right. So the naturality square is actually the same naturality square, essentially, um, and because this is the case, we say that. Uh, Z is the free group on a single generator. Um, all right, so let's see. Uh, we also have a forgetful functor from uh, right modules over some thing, over some ring uh, to set. So now we're taking some R module and forgetting that it's an R module. Um, and just remembering that it's a set. If you want to think about R as being Z, then this is the category of abelian groups. Um, so this is also forget. Uh, and this is represented by R as an R module. So any ring is a module over itself. Um, I think I said right multiplication here, so you can multiply on the right by elements of R. Um, 
and it's linear over itself because it's a ring. So, um, all right, and it's the same thing here. We have mod r from r to some um, right r module m is isomorphic to m. And again, it's entirely determined by where we choose to send 1. So if we send 1 to m, then across this um, m here. All right, so r is the free r module on a single generator. Um, moving on a little bit, uh, but still thinking about forgetful things. We have u from ring to set. And we can still forget. OK, so the thing that I want to end up, up with is the free ring on a single generator. Um, so this is represented by single variable polynomials in Z. Uh, so now we have maps from ring, maps out of these polynomials into some ring is determined by the ring. OK, so in this case, we don't have a choice about where 1 goes, because this has to be a ring homomorphism. So it has to send 1 to 1. Um, and rings have 1. Uh, and non-unital rings are a thing. But you shouldn't ever say unital ring. All ring rings are correctly unital. And I will send out a four-page note about why this is the case. Um, all right, so we know where 1 has to go. 1 has to go to 1. We have a choice about that. Uh, but any ring homomorphism from here to here is determined by where x goes. So we send x to r. And we can pick any element in r for that. And so this goes to r across this. Um, all of these nat all the naturality squares for, these, for this, um, these examples that I've done so far look basically the same. Um, and if you don't believe that, you should do one of them as an exercise. Uh, all right. Getting a little bit more interesting. Let's apply the forgetful, let's take the composition of the forgetful functor um, with taking the nth, pro n nth product. Um, so we go from monoids to set. And now what are we going to do here? This is going to take a monoid and send it to mn, the set of n tuples in m. OK. Uh, so this functor is represented by the free monoid on, OK, I'm just going to pick a set now on the set 1 up to n. All right. So this is the, this is the free monoid on n generators. Um, so we have. Mon, we have monoid homomorphisms from the free monoid on the set 1 to n into some other monoid m. This is isomorphic to mn. Um, <coughs> and it's isomorphic by sending uh, a generator. So um, a monoid homomorphism of this type is determined by where the generators go. Uh, that's the universal property that we had for the free, for the, uh, free monoid on n generators. It looked like um, 
this. So we had our monoid, it uh, sorry, our set, rather. So where's my eraser? There it is. All right. um, so we had our set, say 1 up to n. And then we had the free monoid on this set. And then some other monoid. This came with an inclusion. And then for any other map of sets, we had a unique um, monoid homomorphism here. That was the universal property that we used to define the, um, the free monoid on a set. The yes. Yes, words and concatenation. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, it's not commutative. Yeah. Um, I, exp I deliberately avoided groups because the free monoid is sort of easier to describe, and you have to say a lot of things about equivalence classes for free groups. Um, all right, so we have I mapping to um, some. M i. So each we say where each gen saying saying what one of these is is just saying where each of the generators go, and that maps to the the n tuple consisting of the choices of each of these. So if I if I um, yeah the functor here is this functor. So it, it, takes, it takes a monoid to its nth product, to the product of n copies of m, and then forgets that it's a monoid. Oh, OK. All right. Uh, where are we? OK. So uh, similarly, we have all right, i, yes. Um, so I guess the point is that uh, for this to be a natural isomorphism, it needs to be like these need to be targeting the same sets, and this is a functored set. So this, so this needs to be a functored set to get a natural isomorphism. Um, yes, um, and I. Um, it's possible that the enriched, so there's an enriched version of Yoneda um, for when your um, home sets aren't just sets or aren't sets at all. Um, and hopefully we get to that at some point. But for now, Yoneda is between functors whose targets are set. All right. So we have sort of the same functor. Uh, take nth product and apply forgetful, going from abelian groups to set. Uh, it takes so it takes um, g g n for some group, and this is represented by well, it's represented by the free abelian group on n generators, so it's represented by. Um, the nth coproduct, well, from uh, on z. All right, let's do an example that's not just forgetful, some version of it. Uh, so we have a functor going from rings set, uh, which sends a ring to its um, set of multiplicative units. So it takes r to r times the set of multiplicative units in r. So that's elements of r which have a multiplicative inverse. All right, now this 
is represented by uh, Z adjoin X, X inverse. So Laurent polynomials in one variable. So what do we need? We need to say uh, that maps in the category of ring from the representative object into some other ring is, isom is naturally isomorphic to that ring with this functor applied to it. So it's naturally isomorphic to the collection of units. All right. So what is this? This is the same as our forgetful functor here, um, except that where we send, for this to have a ring homomorphism between these rings, wherever we send x, x inverse has to go to a multiplicative inverse here. So we can't just pick any element of the ring because it might not have a multiplicative inverse. We have to pick an element of the ring which has a multiplicative inverse, and that's what these are. So this again is x going to r, going to r. So that's what this natural isomorphism is, um, which is a component of the natural transformation, the natural isomorphism which recognizes that this is a representable functor. Um, with R a unit. OK. <coughs> so, uh, great. I'm going to go back to here. All right, uh, we have a functor uh, obj going from cat to set. Remember that when we wrote cat with lowercase, that meant the category of small categories. Um, so it has a set of objects. Um, uh, this is. Is, so let's see. Uh, so if we have such a category, it sends the category to its objects. And if we have a functor from C to D, that goes to the function. Um, well, let's just keep calling it F from objects in C to objects in D, which is a function because um, so, so this is sending x to fx. This is a function, again, because these are small categories. Um, all right, this is represented by the category 1 which is the category with a single object and a single identity morphism and nothing else. All right. Uh, another example. Oh, I think my numbering went wrong somewhere. Ah, oh, this was eight. And this was nine. Great. All right, we have a functor morphism more, which takes a category, a small category, to its set of morphisms. Uh, so this is represented by uh, the category 2, which consists of two objects and one non-identity morphism. Um, maybe I should say what's, got, what's, what's happening here. So I want to talk about how cat from the representing object into some category C 
I want this to be isomorphic to more C. But, but picking a functor from this category into some other category precisely picks out two objects and a morphism between them. And for any, any um, morphism in here, there is precisely one functor which does that. All right. Uh, so recall that we called this category the walking arrow. Um, all right. Let's. Right. So what's a map between two morphisms? A map between two morphisms is I have one morphism. Go from cat to set, right? I have uh, I have a morphism F and a morphism G, and a morphism between them is a commutative square like this. Um, and so on On such a morphism, this functor should take uh, so what I end up with a set of morphisms given such a map between morphisms. I want to go. JK maps to so it has to map to a function. Yeah, it has to map to a function on. Well, no, it has to. Sorry, it's a uh, a functor in a map in here is not one of these. A map in here is a natural transformation. So it has to send, so, so, this, so this sends a category to its morphisms, and it sends a functor, which is a map between categories, to a map from the morphisms of C to the morphisms of D. And so it sends. And here, it's just the map that sends f to ff. Yeah. It's the same as this thing, but on morphisms. Ignore the thing I said before. Um, are you unsatisfied with that as a definition of a? Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. OK. So. Uh, all the examples we've done so far have been covariant. We'll do some contravariant ones. <coughs> so example 10, uh, we have curly P going from set to set. This is the power set functor. So it takes a set X to its power set. takes a map. So I said that this was uh, contravariant. So really, it's a, I'm going to say it's a map from set op. Uh, but it takes a map in set, and it sends it to, um, all right. It, so I want, a function, I want a function between power sets. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to send a subset of y into the pre-image, to its pre-image in x. All right, this 
is in Jacksonland here. Uh, and this is represented by uh, the set, which I will call omega. Uh, and we'll, it's the set with these two elements in it, uh, which are which we might call true-false. Um, uh, all right, so let's see. So we have set, so we want maps from a set X. To actually, let's, 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 let's do the whole thing. So what does it mean for this functor to be represented by this object? It means that the functor set blank omega is isomorphic to the power set, is isomorphic to this, is naturally isomorphic to this functor, power set. OK. So what does that mean? Well, it means that on an object, which I'll use x for, we have maps from the object into this set. And that needs to be isomorphic to the power set on x. And how is it? Well, we take some, omega, some sigma, which is a map from x to omega, and we send it to uh, the pre-image of true, which is to say the set of x in x such that omega x is equal to true. All right, so for each, for each subset of x, sigma is the characteristic function. It says true if, if little x is in that subset and false if it's not. <coughs> No, it wouldn't, because I want this to be a bijection. If I added an another element, there would be more, more maps. OK, so uh, what is naturality in this case? So we want set. Uh, and I'm going to do it for a map f from x to y. So now, by contravariance, I need to go from uh, the y to x, so we have set of maps from y to omega. We have a set of maps from x to omega. On this side, we want the power set of y. On this side, we want the power set of x. These are the components of our natural isomorphism, which is of this form. And this is f upper star. And this is, uh, I'm going to write f inverse uh, for taking pre-image. So what does this look like? I take some uh, sigma, which is a map from y to omega. I send it to here. It goes to sigma inverse of true. I send it here, and I get uh, sigma f, because with these um, like map functors, uh, the, what, it, what they do on f is pre-composition pre or post-composition, depending on which, which variance you're looking at. All right, so this goes to f inverse, uh, sigma inverse of true. And this goes to sigma f inverse of true. Uh, and then it's some basic set theory to show that these are the same set. And so this is a natural transformation. Uh, and this is an isomorphism, as I described earlier. All right. So uh, <coughs> we'll do an example.
example that's a bit of a generalization of this example. Um, and I believe you might think of as a, as a good jumping off point if you were to become interested in topos theory. Um, but don't ask me questions about it because I know very little. Uh, so example 11. Um, OK, we have the functor open, which goes from top up to set. And what does this do? It takes a topological space x, and it sends it to the set. Uh, what did I call it? Oh, I just wrote set. OK, to the set of subsets of x that are open. So it just takes a, a topological space and sends it to a set of open sets. Um, and it takes a map between topological spaces. Um, also, I should be clear, like now that I'm doing the op thing, this map is not in set op. This is a map in set. And this is a map in top. I'm being, I'm being kind of lazy, yes? Right, so the reason we're doing this example is to generalize to this example. It's not, I, it, I don't think it's actually necessary here. It's the way that we've constructed the, this functor as being from, as, as going from a subset to a preimage. Um, and and it, it, it makes sense when you move to this because continuity is about open sets having open, uh, open pre-image. <coughs> All right, so this is going to go to, um, well, the same thing as we had there. It's a map which sends some subset of x to the pre-image um, in x. Right, and this makes sense now because um, because f has to be continuous for it to be a map in top, and so the preimage of um, an open set in y is open in x. Uh, and if we sort of did the thing the other way around, we couldn't guarantee that because continuous maps don't necessarily send open sets to open sets. <coughs> All right. Uh, so this is rep represented by a topological space called sus but I'm pretty sure that I misspelled this in here uh, uh, but it's okay I wrote this But I'm pretty sure it's Sir Spin Spinsky. Like there's an R in here somewhere. Yeah, I think may maybe. Yeah, I think this is an R. Sapinski. Oh, there's an E. There's, there's, oh, there's still an E? OK, so I. OK. OK. Uh, everyone knows what I'm talking about. There's that, there's that like triangle. Yeah. All right. If you Google this, I'm sure that the, the, the correct spelling will, will present itself. Um, so this space is, uh, well, it's also, let's say, true-false. So it's the set. It has two elements uh, with, and I'm going to write the topology on this as tau. It's the topology with the empty set, the set containing true, and the whole set. So there's only one element in the power set that's missing here. It doesn't, the set containing false is not true, it is not open, sorry. Um, okay. So what do I mean by this is represented by it? I mean that maps into Sapinski space from a space are isomorphic is naturally isomorphic to 
the open sets in X. So I'm saying that for every open set in X, there is a map from X into a continuous map from X into Sapinski space. And it's the same thing we had there. So it's you take some continuous map from X into Sapinski space and you send it to the pre-image of true, which is open because true is open. All right. This is the topology. I'm talking about this oh, is so this is continuous map, so I need yeah, to specify yeah, uh, yeah, um, and the point being that if I included um, false as an open set on its own, uh, then I would have more continuous maps here. And and this would no longer be a bijection of sets. All right. But in fact, um, Surprise, uh, S, S also represents, represents um, the functor which I will call close, also from top up to set. And it's the map. Sorry? I mean, if you have, if you have, um, if you have an object which represents a functor, if you pick another object that's isomorphic to that, then that also represents it, and a choice of isomorphism chooses an isomorphism between the representing functors, right? So like if you if you have like um, I'm just gonna write this and then scribble it out. If you have blank X uh, and blank Y, uh, if X is isomorphic to Y, then these are isomorphic and choosing an isomorphism this way chooses an isomorphism that way. Um, yeah. All right. So this takes a topological space and sends it to the set of subsets which are closed. And it does the same thing, essentially, on maps. Um, and we have top uh, XS is isomorphic to uh, close, close X. And it's isomorphic by sending a map sigma to the pre image of false. Um, so, uh, open X is, um, <coughs> wait, how do I want to say this? Uh, right. So let's say open is represented by S, so it's naturally isomorphic to top blank S which also represents close. And so the functors open and close are naturally isomorphic to each other, which makes sense because if you pick the open sets, you've determined what the closed sets are. And if you pick the closed sets, you've determined what the open sets are. All right. We're almost done with examples. Uh, so we can prove the unit dilemma. But. I still have two more examples. So I have. Uh, <coughs> so this is an important one. Um, I have the functor set from 
blank times A to B. And this is a functor from set op to set. It takes an object X to... So now I'm just doing this in some category, right? I haven't specified which... Oh, no, I'm doing this in sets. I'm doing this in sets because this is... Set. Oh, OK. Uh, so it takes X to the map of... to the collection of functions from X cross A to B. Uh, and it takes a function from X to Y and it sends it to a function from functions from x cross a to b, uh, from y, sorry, this is contravariant, y to b, to functions from x cross a to b. All right. So we take some, uh, some function in here is a pair. Uh, GH, it's just a pair of functions you, um, fuck, that's not right. No, this is contravariant. Oh, it, okay, so it takes a function which we might write as X, Y, A, uh, sorry. So a function in here can be g of x a. So it's, a, it's got two variables, the variables coming from y and a. And it sends it to the function um, g uh, f of x a. So you have a function from x to y. You do that to your x. And then you take y and a and you do it on this. Happy? No? This is a two, vari two variable function. Um, given such a function, I can define a function on x cross a to b by saying yeah. first do f to x and then input that. Yeah. Isn't that the right? Yes, that's the point. So g is a function from y cross a to b. So now I'm turning it into a function from x cross a to b by sort of sticking f into the input spot for y. <coughs> um, all right, this is this is represented by uh, the set b a, which is the uh, set of functions, so we'll write set of functions from A to B. <coughs> okay, so we need to see uh, some isomorphism. So if I have set from X cross A to B, that needs to be isomorphic to uh, set from x to uh, b a. Um, all right. So, and the isomorphism here is I pick a function which goes from x from x cross a to b. So I'm going to have x a. And I'm going to send this. No, actually, you know what? I'll do it like this. So I have some function f from x cross a to b. And across this, I send it to the function which sends, which takes, so it needs to be a function from the set x into the set of functions from a to b. So it takes x and it takes it to the function which sends a to fxa. Are people happy with that? 
this is what the computer scientists call currying. We will see this again. I, I believe that's kind of, that is the point, but uh, I don't I don't understand Haskell. Sorry. All right, um, and the last one I want to put up, but not really say too much about, is if you have the f the composition of the forgetful functor and the dual functor. So, um, dual is a functor from vector spaces over f to vector spaces over f. Uh, op. Um, so this, so dual takes me from vector spaces over f to vector spaces over f, and then the f u is forgetful, and so that takes me to set. So it's important here that when I'm talking about representability, all of our functors are going into set. Um, this is so dual uh, followed by forget is represented by the field. Because remember that the field, the, the, the dual functor takes you from the vector space uh, V to the vector space of linear transformations from V to the ground field. Um, but then, there's, then there's this, that's, not a, that's not strictly a set, and so we forget down to set. Um, but OK, that's, that's uh, our collection of examples of representable functors. Um, and now we can move on to the meat of this, uh, which is the UNA dilemma. All right. Coffee is probably very cold now. Still good. Um, let's. I'm just going to raise everything. No, because I would rather be doing it with a bucket. And <laughs> it's going to sound really odd on the recording, because it only picks up stuff from the mic. So it would just be me saying something about a bucket. Right. Maybe we'll leave that up, because Kelly ran off. Um, right up. Okay. All right. So, theorem. This theorem is the UNA dilemma. OK, so we have some functor from C to D. Uh, where C is locally small, although, I mean, the point is that well, you should mostly just consider things that are locally small. Uh, and X is some object in C. There is a bijection. All right, and it goes from home from this represented functor by x to f, and that's isomorphic to fx. So this is a bijection. Uh, so I think, in fact, I probably want to say that 
this is going to be set. Um, otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. All right. Uh, and this is given by this bijection. So what's home between these two? Well, these two are functors. So a map between them is a natural transformation. So we'll say alpha from this represented functor to f. And it's going to take us to the set fx. Um, it's going to take us to alpha x of idx. So alpha x is a component in this natural transformation. It's a component going from the, order, the endomorphisms on x, so maps from x to itself. And it's a map going from that to f of x. Um, the identity on x is an element of this. And so this makes sense as an element in f of x. All right. And further, um, this is natural in x and All right, so um, a priori, this isn't a um, isn't a set like this. This collection of natural transformations. There's no reason before we start proving the Yonet lemma to believe that that thing is a set. That's one of the things that we see from the Yonet lemma, is that that is in fact a set. Uh, there is a set of natural transformations. All right. So let's get to it. This is probably going to take up more than the four boards I have. All right. So we're going to define a map. Uh, <coughs> This, this map, in particular, going this way. So um, as above. All right, I'm just going to stick this in here. All right, I have written here, note this makes sense. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think I was talking about this making sense. Um, OK, so. What do we want to do? Well, we want to start with some natural transformation and um, oh, no, the next line in that was me making sense of that. Uh, let's um, so actually, I will write this down. So uh, given uh, alpha from uh, this represented f oh. so given alpha uh, from this represented functor to f um, we have uh, alpha x so the component on x is a map from x across x to fx. Uh, this contains the identity. And so this maps to alpha x, the identity on x. And so the thing makes sense. All right, now I want to define the map back in the other direction. The, I'm going to do this by showing that I have an inverse function. All right, so I'm going to define uh, psi uh, from fx to hom 
So I'm going to define a map from this set to this set of natural, or this collection of natural transformations. Yes. So the point is I'm going to show that there's a bijection from this collection to this set, and so this is a set. I mean, the way, you should, the way you should think about this, what I'm doing now, is I have a way of assigning a natural transformation to an element here. I'm going to show that I can assign an element here to a natural transformation, okay. and that those are mutually inverse. Okay. So, so, so like this assignation is like literally just renaming the things. Okay. All right. Um, so this is going to take some element, x in fx, send it to um, uh, psi x, um, which will be a natural transformation of this form. OK, so we need to build this thing. So let. So I, I need to tell you what the components on, on this are, of this natural transformation are. So we're going to let psi. So yeah. So I'm going to build this natural transformation step by step. So I haven't actually said anything here when I've said define. Like uh, we we are defining more accurately. Um, so this. So I want to define what this is on x. So the representing object, or a representing object. And so it goes from cxx to f of x. And I'm going to declare that it takes the identity on x to little x this element that we wanted. All right. So we want this thing to be a natural transformation. So it had better satisfy naturality squares. Uh, so if we, uh, given, given some f from x to itself, uh, we have this square. All right, this is, uh, I want this to be uh, phi of x. Sorry. Oh, I had that the right way around. I should have given one of these not the name x, but here we are. Um, all right, so this is little x, the component on big x. This is the same thing. Um, and this, this is going to be f applied to f, and this is going to be uh, pre, uh, post composition with x. OK, so I haven't told you what this is on anything except for the identity on x. So let's start with the identity on x. So we know what this map is on that. It's going to take me to x. So going down we're going to get to ff of x. OK, f is what a, like we started with a functor. So f of f makes sense. That's just some function between it, from f of x to itself. Now, if we go this way, well, the identity on x post composed with f is f. So this is going to be f. Uh, and now, I haven't defined what this map is on any function in here except for the identity. But I want this square to commute. I kind of don't have a choice. Um, because otherwise, this thing I'm building won't be a natural transformation. So this has to go to here. And so now we have defined this component 
on all maps from x to itself. This has to send f to f of f of x. So, um, psi x x um, sends f to f of f x. Uh, okay. Great. So this argument actually extends to the other to, to the other components. So given given f from x to y, uh, we have this diagram now x x c x y f x y. All right, so we have this component um, on x. We ha we're trying to build this component on y. We know that this has to be f of f, and this is f lower star. So again, we start with the identity up here. This has to go to x. And going down here, while well, post-composing with f again gives us f, this map takes us to f, 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 x. And again, for this to be natural, because we want this to be a natural transformation, this, this has to map to here. And so in fact, we have defined all of the components of this natural transformation. So. x of y takes us from maps from x to y to, uh, oh, no, I just want to say what it does on actual maps. So it takes us from f to ff of x. Great, so we've defined these components. Um, Now, we used naturality, like the fact that we want this thing to be natural, to say that if it's natural, there's only one choice of component after I choose where this identity goes um, for, each, for each object. So I pick where the identity on x goes, and that fixes what the components have to be for every other object. Um, but we haven't actually proven naturality here completely. Because we have to prove it for f, where f is not between x and something. It's between two things in the category. Um, so we need, need to check uh, naturality of psi. So given, given a map f from y to z, we want to check that maps from x to y, maps from x to z, f of y, f of z. These are the components. psi x, so this is psi x y, this is psi x z, this is f of f, this is f lower star. OK, so what's happening here? All right, we have some map g, and it's going to map across this component by this to f G, wait, yeah, F G of X, and then this is going to map to F F composed with F G of X. Oh, actually, I'm going to leave out the stupid composition symbol. All right, now if we 
uh, post compose f with uh, g with f, then we get fg. And then we do this to fg, and we get f of fg applied to x. But these two things are equal because f is a functor. OK, so now we are confident that uh, psi little x is a natural transformation. <coughs> so, so, wait. Yeah, so little x is natural. So what I'm going to set as an exercise is that there are, there's a unit dilemma for that as well. Uh, and it changes the diagrams, right? Because, because if I do the op version, then, then the, so if I do the, the version from C op to set, then this is now natural transformations from the functor of maps into x. So this would be blank, and this would be x and f. Um, and the same argument works, but doing it again is a good exercise for getting to grips with duality. All right. So I'm going to let uh, alpha be a natural transformation from the represented functor to f, then psi phi of alpha is psi of, OK, this thing took a natural transformation to its x component applied to the identity. So this is alpha x applied to the identity on x. Um, and <coughs> so what I've shown here is that after you've determined what the identity um, goes, so after you, if you have such a functor, if you have given this functor, if you have a natural transformation to some other functor, then once you've determined where the identity goes on the component on x, then you've entirely determined the functor, right? Because once you've determined this, you don't have any choice about what the components are going to be because it has to be natural. Um, and so uh, the natural trans this is an element in f of x. If you let this be little x, then this is going to be the natural transformation which takes the identity to this. But there's only one such natural transformation, and so it has to be alpha. Um, I'm going to leave that to you to verify that you're happy with it. Um, but uh, sort of precisely the work that we did here tells us that um, this thing has to be this. Because, because this sends the identity to the same element as this sends the identity to. And there's only one such natural transformation. All right. So now we need to do the other direction. So we're going to let. Uh, x be an element of fx, then all right, so we want 
phi applied to psi of x. This is phi of psi little x. Now applying phi is going to take us to phi uh, psi of little x of x applied to the identity on x, but we built that to be x. All right. So we have our bijection. All right. Now I made some claims about naturality of this um, of this uh, and I don't think I'm going to take a break today because uh, because I want to get through quite a bit. <coughs> um, maybe I can squeeze my claims about naturality onto this board. Actually, no. I'm just going to move this across and use the other two boards. All right. So, uh, natural in F. OK, so natural in F, what does that mean? It means we want to take some natural transformation from F to some other functor and see that there's some naturality square commutes with respect to this bijection. So we're going to let beta be a natural transformation from some f to g. Um, and we want to check, we want to check, all right, what are we checking? We're checking hom from the represented functor f. Um, we're post-composing with this beta. So this is going to be beta lower star um, cx blank to g. Uh, and this is going to go to f of x. And this is going to go to g of x. All right, we have a map between these because we have a natural transformation. And that's going to be just the component of beta on x. Uh, all right, so I want to start with some natural transformation here. This is going to take us to um, the natural transformation, beta composed with alpha, because this is just post composition. And this takes us to. Uh, alpha x of the identity on x. And similarly, this takes us to uh, beta alpha x of the identity on x. All right. Uh, but this is because of com because com when you do the um, vertical composition of natural transformations, it's just one component composed with the other component. So this is beta x, alpha x applied to the identity on x, um, which is precisely what this is. Uh, which thing? So this is an element in here. This is a function. So I'm just applying this function to this element. All right, so that's naturality in f. Natural in x. All right. 
right, so we have um, f from x to y. It's just some uh, something in C, a map, a map in C. And we want to check. All right. Now what are we doing? OK, we have home C x blank to f. We have home C y blank to f f of x, f of y. All right, this is f of f. This is f star, f star. Um, so I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. No, I'll explain what, what I mean by that now. So f star. I might write it here. F, F star uh, is a map. Is a is a functor from. Uh, well, it's a natural transformation from C, X. Like, all right. Oh, fuck! What am I doing? No, this is. This is y. This is x. This is y. And this is x. OK. So f upper star is a natural transformation from um, no. okay. f upper star upper star is a natural transformation from Yeah, so in this case, I'm using it contravariantly. So f is a contravariant functor? No, f is not a contravariant functor. f is covariant. But then on the right hand side of the square. This is still a covariant functor. This is a covariant functor. Yeah, but on the right hand side of the square, you've got f of f. That's the xy. Yes. So this is happening. Yeah, but f is. Oh, fuck. Is OK, wait a sec. Um, no, maybe I had it right the first time then. Let's see. All right. Let's see. We have So I want to go from uh, CX Okay, so the problem here, this this is precomposition twice. Precomposition is contravariant, but I'm doing contravariant things twice, and so this is covariant. So that's that is the right way for that to be. I want to go from um, C X blank to so right. So F f upper star is a natural transformation from cy is in this direction. And then I precompose with that, and I get um, a natural trans, and I get a function in this direction. So f star upper star 
goes from um, goes from home C X blank F to home C Y blank F. And it takes a natural transformation F in here. No, I can't use F. It takes a natural transformation alpha in here, and it takes it to um, f uh, it takes it to f alpha. It takes a natural transformation, yeah. Because this is f upper star applied to alpha. OK. So we're doing two contravariant things, one after the other, until we get a covariant thing. All right. So, um, so here, I want to start with some natural transformation. This takes me to. Um, This takes me to alpha f. Uh, and then this <coughs> takes me to uh, alpha f y of the identity on y. This takes me to um, alpha x of the identity on x. And then this takes me to f of f alpha x, the identity on x. And now I need to see that these two things are equal. <coughs> so um, So I have this naturality square, xx to fx, cxy to fy, ff. And then here I have f lower star. And I take the identity on x. And in this direction, I get alpha x identity on x. And then here I get f of f alpha x identity on x. And then in this direction, I get f. And then here I get um, uh, I get. Alpha y of f. Yep. Yes, OK. I did want to star here. That's what I have. That's why I've written in my notes, but I didn't see where it came from. Okay, so then I have that. Uh, okay, okay, and then so let's see. Going down to here, um, I have that alpha 
f star y um, goes from c y y to uh, c x y to f of y. All right, so I take the identity on y. And then this sends it to f. And then this sends it to um, alpha y of f. OK, and so this naturality square that I just drew tells me that these two are equal. Um, right. All right. Um, so this, sorry, this is getting very messy. Um, this part here tells me that alpha f star y applied to the identity on y is equal to alpha x y. So this tells me, gives me this equality here. No. This gives me, ah, sorry. Uh, the thing I, this thing, gives me that this is equal to alpha y applied to f. And then this square tells me that gives me this equality, which gives me that these are equal. OK, sorry that last bit was a bit messy, but are people happy with how all of that went? So I wanted to show that this this square commuted. And I did it by finding something in between these two which were equal to both of them. So this first bit gives me that these two are equal. Uh, this bit, which I should have done first, gives me that these two are equal. This bit gives me that these two are equal. Wait, this bit gives me this bit. This bit gives me the bottom bit. All right, and that's it. That's that last bit aside, I'm fairly happy with how that went, so I'll put a square there. I think that's only the second time that I've used a tombstone in this class. All right. Um, so it's 1116. I have a page and a half of stuff I still want to talk about, but let's stop here and take a short break.